Hello, good afternoon. We are, uh, we are going to start the uh, long chain of introductions that will uh, eventually lead to a panel discussion. Um, I am going to just start it off. My name is Brian Jacob. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy Close Up. We are kind of co sponsoring the event with the Ford School. Um, and I want to thank uh, Jeff Mornoff, in particular, a professor in sociology, who has been the uh, mastermind be behind this event. Uh, I believe it originally s stemmed from kind of an interest from a class he's teaching, but we decided it was sufficiently interesting and important for everyone, even beyond the class, to, to learn about. So we um, tried to put together this panel, and uh, I'd like to thank Jeff for that. Uh, I'm now going to let Jeff kind of introduce the, uh, the key speakers. Um, but please, everyone, uh, I, I hope this is uh, an enjoyable event, and I hope we have a lot of good dialogue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. I'm going to uh, leave it to our first guest to explain what the format today is going to be. And uh, let me just take a few seconds to um, welcome everybody and also to say some important thank yous before I introduce Deputy Director Schranz. First of all, big thank you to Close Up. Uh, in addition to um, being really generous in sponsoring today's event, and like Brian said, this started actually as uh, an idea for guest speakers from my undergraduate criminology class. And a couple people in the Department of Corrections, some of whom are here today, uh, started throwing some ideas at me that, well, maybe we should have like a panel discussion with the current director and some of the former directors and uh, around some of the current issues like um, uh, prison population reduction and prisoner reentry initiative. And uh, I thought, well, if we're going to do something like that, it would really be great to have that open to a, a broader public than just my criminology class. Um, looking around the room, I see some people from my criminology class here, and that's good. Um, I know that we had to schedule this at a different time than the regular class meets, so I'm sorry about, well, I'm apologizing to people who aren't even here, so, they're, so I'm kind of not preaching to the choir, whatever the opposite of that is. Um, anyhow, I appreciate that. The other thing about Close Up is that they were uh, really pivotal in helping my colleague David Harding and I start a project that we're continuing with great support from the Department of Corrections looking at uh, prisoner reentry in Michigan. And um, I first met our first guest, Dennis Schrantz, who's Deputy Director of the Department of Corrections, about five years ago, I think, introduced by Rosemary Sari uh, at an event. And um, since then, I became really interested in what was happening in, in Michigan around the uh, Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative. And, uh, it's just been a wonderful collaborative experience since then working with the Department of Corrections. Um, I can't emphasize enough how open they have been to research and to, to giving opportunities uh, to let research happen. Paulette Hatchett, who's sitting uh, in the middle of the, of the room there, is someone who works for the Department of Corrections and has been working with us on a daily and weekly basis to try to go through the data that we collect from their databases and make sense out of it. And um, there's, it's, a, it's, you know, data collection and, and research takes a long time, but it's not because of any resistance on the part of the Department of Corrections to, to re release their data to us. It's just because we're dealing with a voluminous amount of, of data um, that wasn't collected for the purposes of research. It was collected for the purposes of operating a correction system. So just a big thank you to the Department of Corrections and, and, uh, and also to Close Up for helping us get our research going and for also um, leading to some nice spin-off activities. Like in our class, we've had three, two and next week it'll be a third prison tour of different prison facilities around Michigan, again facilitated by the Department of Corrections. And the students, I think, are really appreciative of those opportunities to be able to uh, go on those tours. So then um, our first guest, as I mentioned, is Dennis Schrantz. He's Deputy Director of Planning and Community Development Administration at the Department of Corrections. He has many responsibilities, including uh, strategic planning and collaborative efforts with the department's executive policy team to develop and implement plans to control prison growth and to manage the department's prisoner reentry initiative, which I just alluded to a moment ago. Um, he's also, um, his, this administration is also responsible for implementing, monitoring, and evaluating the Michigan Community Corrections Act, which, which intends to reduce prison admissions and address issues regarding jail overcrowding. Um, and also, the, he oversees the Office of Research and Planning, which, as I mentioned before, we've been working with and helps researchers like ourselves um, and also people who need uh, corrections data uh, in, you know, in the state and elsewhere to make sense out of uh, corrections 
trends. Dennis has a very lengthy resume uh, that goes back to prior <clears throat> positions that he served in at uh, Wayne County where he was director of adult services division um, in the Department of Community Justice and also uh, prior to that in North Carolina. He's been in this post as deputy director for what, six years, something like that, give or take, a little bit. And he's an incredibly dynamic speaker and also came to guest lecture for my class last year and I think left me with lower teaching evaluations than I would have had otherwise because on the last day of class and they saw how exciting he was compared to, to, to my bland lectures. Um, but anyway, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dennis Schrams. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you, Professor Morinoff and Professor Harding as well. And of course, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Studies show that there's actually very little direct correlation between crime and incarceration in that the cost benefit of imprisonment does not support lengthy periods of incarceration as the best way to reduce crime. Return to prison rates for former prisoners who serve one, two, three, four, or five years in prison are nearly the same. The rising cost of the corrections budget, in fact, is not driven by increases in crime. It is driven by the sheer size of the prison system. Personnel costs, benefits, health care for prisoners, and utility costs. The size of the corrections system is driven more by policy decisions than by crime. Today we're delighted to be here to talk with and hear from all of you and our two panelists who are uniquely suited to talk about what's happened in the state of Michigan over the past 30 years because they have been directors of the Department of Corrections during that point in time, that long period of growth that saw an increase in the prison population under Director Brown of 75% increase 15,000 additional inmates over the six years, six and a half years that he was director. And now, several years later, with Director Caruso, a contraction of the prison system or a reduction, not only in the population of folks who are in prison, but obviously closing prisons as well, which has recently been in the news. The format today is going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers and then I'm going to ask Director Brown to speak first and answer three questions and then reintroduce Director Caruso to answer those three questions as well. Then we'll engage in a question and answer session with the audience. There are some index cards on that wall, that short wall over there. There's a little cup sitting on it. You can see the cup. Uh, in, in a couple of places and over here as well. So during the uh, presentations today, please fill out those cards and put your questions on those cards. And when you're done filling them out with your question, just raise it in the air and we've got a couple of folks that'll pick it up. And I'm gonna go working through these cards and pick the ones that are most pertinent, I think, to the discussions that, that we have and frankly of the policy issues of the day. So that will be the format. First, let me introduce Robert Brown, Jr., who was a director of the Department of Corrections for six and a half years, retiring in 1991. During his 30 years with the department, Director Brown served as deputy director in charge of the state prisons, a deputy warden, a parole officer, and a prison counselor. He has also consulted for many criminal justice agencies serving as a consent agreement monitor for a federal court in Illinois and working with the prison systems of Connecticut, Illinois, and Pennsylvania. Among Mr. Brown's many honors are awards from the American Correctional Association and the Association of State Correctional Administrators. Director Patricia L. Caruso is currently the director of the Department of Corrections, where she has worked since 1988 and she too, like Mr. Brown, has served in several capacities, which include three years as a business manager, nine years as a warden, two years as regional prison administrator, and 10 months as a deputy director of correctional facilities administration, similar to Mr. Brown's prior employment. 
In July of 2003, she was appointed director of the Department of Corrections by Governor Jennifer Granholm. Director Caruso received her bachelor's in political science and sociology from Lake Superior State University and a master's in comprehensive occupational education from none other than the University of Michigan. Yes, a little applause there. <laughs> <laughs> Director Caruso was elected vice president of the American Correctional Association for a two-year term beginning in August 2008. She's also served on ACA's Commission on Accreditation for Correction since July of 2006 and has been involved as a member of the ACA Standards Committee. She's currently also serving as the vice president of the Association of State Correctional Administrators and previously served as their treasurer and she has a long list of accomplishments. You're very graced today to have two extraordinary leaders in corrections in the state of Michigan and have not only provided immense leadership, but have responded to both the political and the operational issues that confronted them in their roles as directors of corrections. There's three questions that I'm going to ask each of the directors to answer. The first is, during their tenure, what have been some of the primary political issues that have been at play during the time when you provided leadership for the department? The second question is, what are the major operational issues of the day during your tenure in terms of management of the department during that time frame? And also then, because we are quite uh, interested in the prisoner reentry initiative, what was going on during your tenure regarding prisoner reentry, uh, et cetera. For Director Brown, who will speak first, I think it's important to uh, take a look here at not actually what happened during Director Brown's tenure, but what has happened since. This chart shows a very steep increase in the prison population beginning in 1991. But the fact of the matter is, is that increase began down here somewhere. And over those years that Director Brown uh, was director, we saw a 74% increase in the population in the prison system. And that escalating size of that prison population has not, did not stall or stop until way into 2002, 2003, when Director Crusoe was appointed by Governor Granholm. Since the director, Caruso, has been in her position, things have changed, as you can see from the tail end of that chart, where the prison population went down. She'll tell you a couple things, I'm sure, about why it went up for a while, and then it's gone down again. So this sets the stage for this discussion. This next chart is one which was recently presented to the Michigan legislature and shows what the future holds. This is the tail end of the chart that you just saw, and then where the colors become uh, green, you see that that is a projected number of prison beds that we will need beginning in fiscal year 2010 and running through 2015. So when you look at these pictures next to each other, which is kind of fun to do, um, you can actually see this dramatic shift from the time frame uh, before and up to Director Brown's tenure, and then now changing and going directly in the opposite direction. And that sets the stage for our discussion today. So with that, I'm going to uh, ask Director Brown to answer those three questions in any order, and actually he can say anything he wants because I'm not gonna interrupt, but he has 15 minutes to talk about those political implications, the operational issues of the day, and what was the status of reentry. After that, I'll reintroduce Director Cruz. So thank you, Director Brown. Join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you, Dennis. You know, when I agreed to do this event, uh, I thought it'd be a piece of cake. But as I began to put thoughts together, I realized that 18 years of retirement have taken a toll on my memory. Human nature helps us remember the pleasant things. Uh, and while I enjoyed my tender as director, 
the growing prison population during that time was not a pleasant aspect of the job. I was deputy director for 14 years before, uh, before being appointed director, so I knew what I was being handled, handed. Uh, I, I was there, I was part of it. There were no surprises to me. During the late 60s and early 70s, there had been a substantial increase in crime. There was a lot of speculation as to why. Vets returning from Vietnam, increased violence on television, a breakdown of family values, baby boomers reaching the uh, crime-prone ages, and so on. Michigan's 1960s prison system was okay for 8,000 prisoners in 1973, but not nearly adequate for 15,000 in 1983. In 1986, for example, we had almost as many new admissions during that year as there had been in the total system in 1973. How did we control the increase? Well, in 1981, the legislature passed the Prison Overcrowding Emergency Powers Act. In my opinion, that was a good law. But we had to abuse it because we had so many people coming in prison. And how it worked, if the prison population exceeded capacity for 30 consecutive days in the Michigan Corrections Commission had to certify to the governor that that had happened. The governor and, and his or her staff had uh, 20 days, I believe it was, to check, check our figures, make sure that we were accurate in what we were telling them. And then the governor declared a prison overcrowding emergency. When the governor did that, the director of the Department of Correction had to reduce the minimum sentence of all prisoners with a minimum sentence by 90 days. Now, in those days, there were about 1,000 a, a prisoners that became eligible for parole consideration every 90 days. So you can see when once I declared and started taking those off, that the tremendous workload, tremendous workload with our records people, refiguring times and, and, and and establishing new uh, uh, minimum sentence expiration dates. And then the parole board got all this onslaught, 90 days worth of people were all, all of a sudden eligible all at once. So they were busy. They were a little more than busy, I think. This law was triggered nine times in the <clears throat> roughly three years, I think, at uh, yeah, I said it was passed in 1981, and we quit using it. Uh, uh, the last time it was triggered, it was in 1984. Nine times. Uh, you were a prisoner doing time with minimum sentence during that time. You got your sentence reduced by 90 days nine times. That's, a, that's 810 days. That's well over two years taken off your sentence. Everyone who was paroled on their minimum sentence at the expiration of their minimum sentence was, in fact, an early release case. Now, when you're dealing with thousands of, excuse the expression, thugs, somebody's going to do something wrong. And that happened. A parolee killed an East Lansing police officer. And all the hands went up in the air. The governor called me to his office and said, Bob, we're not going to use that law anymore. I'm going to get you some money and we're going to build a couple of prisons. <laughs> I said, Governor, we need a couple of prisons but we need to do something else along with building those prisons because those two 
we're not going to stop it, too, if that's all we do. He said, what's that? And I said, well, you know, if we could do something with youth, you know, for every dollar we put into building prisoners, take a look at putting 50 cents into programs, and I mean programs for, for toddlers, for three, four, five, six-year-olds. And then by the time those kids reach the crime-prone age, we won't need all these prisons. Governor said, you know, you're right, but right now we're going to build these prisons. I mean, he, what else could he say, really? So we started building prisons, and uh, it went on. It, I'm not sure when the prison building ended, but I'm sure it expanded over 20 years of building prisons. You know, the crime rate in the 60s and 70s increased, uh, as I indicated, and there were a number of reactions to that increase. Most of them knee-jerk reactions. We got things like uh, an increase in habitual offender sentencing. We got mandatory sentences. The public legislature were demanding longer sentences, and the legislature moved to limit judges' discretion. Good time was, released, was eliminated, prison good time, and that was a major blow to it. And I'll give you an example of what happened when we were able to, to control the prison population with the Emergency Powers Act, because we kept releasing people. We kept making people eligible. Every time we get in a bind, we'd be 30 days over capacity, and it'd take about another 30 days to get everything, to all the administrative stuff done so we could start releasing people. The parole board's got to hold hearings and so forth. In 1983, that's when we were using the, the Early Release Act, there were 7,000 releases from Michigan prisons. In 1984, after we stopped using, the, when we stopped the early releases, there were only 3,141, uh, 3,141 releases, so you can see the dr drastic reduction in the number of people being released, and which has just added tremendously to the prison buildup. When we started building these prisons, what did it mean operationally? Uh, it meant we had to do a lot of things that we hadn't had to do in a shorter time in the past or previously. As I indicated, uh, the pro board had additional work, our records people had additional work. Uh, we had to find space for these people, especially after the, we quit, the, uh, quit using the Early Release Act. <clears throat> we used prison industry warehouses, uh, and that was after we filled up all the gymnasiums. We had people, every place I think except in the toilets and the, and the mop closets. Uh, we had people sleeping on the floor. Uh, we were uh, continually uh, wrestling and trying to explain to the courts where we were at and what we were trying to do and uh, trying to get money to do more. Uh, did I say we had people in tents? We had just, just whatever. One of my little tricks uh, when I was deputy director in, in charge of the prisons, they'd call me from the reception center and say, uh, Mr. Brown, we are out of space. What do you mean you're out of space? We don't have any more beds. Well, look, guys, everybody has to be someplace. So we got to find a place to put them. I say, load up. If you got some people eligible to go in a camp program, we had 
12, 13 camps at the time, minimum custody. You got people eligible to go to the camp program. Yes, we do. Our bus held 40 people. I said, put 40 of them on the bus. <clears throat> Head for Camp Waterloo. Camp Waterloo was just east of Jackson Louis. I said, tell the driver to take his time. <laughs> They don't have any beds at Waterloo. I says, just get 40 people on the bus and head for Waterloo. I called Waterloo and I said, get 40 people ready to go to Camp Lehman. Camp Lehman was up by Grayling. They said, well, they don't have any beds at Camp Grayling. I said, well, you just get some people ready to go because you got a bus coming from the reception center with 40 people for, new people for you. Now you see the picture? I just kept shuffling people, shuffling from, from, from the reception center at Jackson through a system of, of 12 camps clear to the western side of the Upper Peninsula. So that gave me 40 more beds. They were seats on the bus, but you know, I couldn't keep 40 people on the bus continuous. I mean, the same 40 people, but I could keep rotating them. And so it was little things like that and ingenuity, and I didn't come up with all of them. Staff helped me figure out ways to, to shuffle around and, and, and get people, get through the, the, the hassle. We tried, well, let me say this. Of course, when we were adding a prison, we were adding a new prison about every nine weeks. Either a temporary prison or or we're getting, we're getting prison built after the governor said we were going to build them. You have to staff those prisons. We were starting a new class at the academy for corrections officers every month. Those classes consisted of from 150 to 225 people. The training effort was just tremendous. We had to train additional trainers. Uh, we had to, to uh, uh, train people in the, in the institutions to, to be shadowed once we got the people out of the, out of the classroom working into the institutions to, to get some OJT. Um, and the personnel people, of course, had to do all the screening and hiring of these people to get them on board. We did a number of things that, that uh, staff did not particularly like. I insisted that every class have a supervisor sitting in it from the, from the institutions, a sergeant, lieutenant, or a captain, so that the people in the institutions knew what the people in the academy would be taught. I got to say that many of them needed to be, many of those people that were observing needed it. And we saw great success in that, in that, in that program uh, because many times those supervisors would say to us, hey, they're telling them this in, in, the, in the academy. That's not the way we do it. Well, then, of course, we could get somebody in and resolve it and see Okay, how should it be done? What's, what's happening? Why aren't you doing it that way? That's the way I thought it was being done, you know, and, and those kind of things. So, so that worked out pretty good. Prisoner control became a problem because when you don't have the space to separate people, to put people, to, to secure people, uh, you've got a problem. If you have a, a disturbance, I don't care how small it is, you need to be able to separate people, get them locked up. When you got people sleeping on the floor in the gymnasium and not in cells or locked room, rooms that you can lock, then you've got a real problem. Uh, and so much of it depends on building the kind of respect between staff and prisoners that has to be there, should be there anyhow, but it became even more important during those days. The 
Then we started thinking about releasing people and what happens to them when they go out of prison and back into the community. We didn't have enough field agents. When I was a parole officer in Detroit, I supervised 150 people on parole. Way, way, way too many. And even if I say so, I sound a little egotistical, but I'm better than most of them too. I tried desperately to get additional appropriations for parole probation officers. I'm sorry to say that I couldn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't accomplish that, that goal. I was asked by appropriations committee, did I want prison officers or do you want parole officers? I said, I need both. You know, you're only going to get one of them. We only got so much money. Well, they didn't realize how much more money they were going to be spending in years down the road with the way the prison population built up. I think I'll stop there, Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate it. So we've set the stage for understanding that this growth, growth of the uh, prison system began before Director Brown's, Brown's tenure and then continued. In fact, the last time that we had any sustained reductions in the prison population was the period between 1962 and 1966 when it dropped 29 percent. Every year uh, since then it's uh, been rising until about 2002 when the growth started to slow. And finally, in January of 2007, between then and now, 2009, it has dropped for the first time since 1966 uh, uh, in any great way, a reduction of 3,200 uh, prisoners, a 6.3% drop. In the past six years, in fact, the Department of Corrections has reduced its spending by nearly $400 million by cutting the bureaucracy reconfiguring the prison space and implementing the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative. At the helm of all this was Director Caruso, who began her right-sizing in the prison system nearly the first week that she received her appointment. And so far under her leadership, the Department of Corrections has closed nine institutions with three more prison facilities slated for closing this year, in fact, in a couple of months, and then this dramatic drop that is shown here in the prison capacity will begin uh, in uh, the beginning of fiscal year 2010. One of my um, early images of the director and her leadership was the probably two weeks after she was appointed as a director and she was brand new in that job, although she'd been running the uh, corrections, the prison system for some time. And we had a horrific murder. And uh, there were uh, just incredible amount of press about uh, this murder. A man had uh, killed his wife and uh, his children. And the director stood up unblinking to the press and said, this is our responsibility. And she spoke honestly and openly to that throng of media and that transparency and that openness to open the doors of this department for review and for scrutiny has not stopped since then. It's a great pleasure to introduce Director Caruso, my boss. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And to the university, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. It particularly is to be sitting up front with Bob Brown, who will be back. He just stepped out for a moment, but I'm really honored to do that. Bob is uh, my mentor uh, in many ways. I always tease Bob that it's his fault, good or bad, for all this, um, because Bob took a huge chance on a young woman in our department when he named me the warden of a large facility that was in a whole bunch of trouble. And it was a big chance because I'd only worked for the department for three years, and all of that time I had worked in the business office. It was very controversial, as you might imagine. Bob took a big chance on me, and um, 
later, obviously, he at some point retired. Um, I was a warden um, almost the entire tenure for other directors. But Bob and I have stayed in touch over the years, and certainly during the six years that I've been the director, Bob has continued to be a mentor and someone I can bounce <coughs> ideas off. And, and Bob is someone who is respected throughout our country in corrections for his knowledge and his integrity. And so for me, it, it's just an honor anytime I do something with Bob. It's interesting listening to his remarks. I, I came to our department in 1988. And obviously, I came during that buildup. And I was a warden in our system during that period of time from 1991 through 2000, where on that other slide where you see that, that, num that line go up. And some of the politics that we dealt with was we just accepted that that was what would happen. When I um, became the deputy director of our department, a job I held for a short period of time before I became the director, all of our discussions revolved around the fact that we were going to hit 50,000 prisoners imminently, we were running out of money, we were running out of beds. There, there were not any discussions at that point in time in terms of whether we could control that at, at all. It, we, we were in um, an operational type of a crisis planning mode on how we were going to deal with this. We had a couple of facilities that we had taken offline and closed in order to, uh, in one case, to, to do some remodeling if it was needed, and others that we had just closed. And we, our internal plans were to go back into them. And I remember becoming the deputy director in September, and our plans were in March, that we were going to reopen a 1,200-bed prison because we were going to run out of beds. And, and that, was, that was just the mindset, and that it was going to happen, and we had to prepare for it. At that time, we were running the fifth largest prison system in the United States. The only states who had a higher population than we did were California, New York, Florida, and Texas. And we accepted that too. In fact, I, I lived in fear that one day I wasn't going to be saying five, that I was going to be saying four. And those states were a lot bigger than we were. But it, it was, um, th there was a sense of, of a frightening time. Clearly, political environment is a big piece of this, and, and it was at that point in time, uh, we had an election in Michigan, we had a new governor, and um, Governor Granholm came in with a lot of background in law enforcement, and, and part of her platform was that we ought not to have to spend so much money on the Department of Corrections and locking people up, that there are other ways of dealing with these issues than what we're doing, and there are some things we need to do differently. And so that set a new direction. At the same time, if we roll this back to 2001, 2002, governor takes office January 2003, by then Michigan is a good year and a half into a really serious economic situation that had not hit most other states at that point. And so our $1.7 billion budget Everyone was looking at that. We were 20, 25% of the general fund, and everyone was focusing on how much money was going into the Department of Corrections. So we had a new governor, we had a number of new legislators. Term limits had come into play by that point in time because we were starting to see a turnover in the legislature that hadn't happened previously. And, and so all of that environment comes into play. Much of what we, we deal with in corrections really truly is, is counterintuitive. And I'll give you an example, and it was something I experienced in a hearing in front of the legislature very early on when uh, I had a legislator tell me that um, I wouldn't have a population problem or a prison problem if we didn't treat them so well. Because if we treated prisoners a little bit worse, no one would want to come back. And, and I remember saying to the legislator, not in the hearing, but in, in his office later, that I understand that for, for the average person, maybe the law-abiding person, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that going to prison may sound like the worst thing that could happen to you. But the truth is that every statistic and every piece of research will show that people who are treated inhumanely will become more inhumane, and that people who do time in prison and have 
less tools to cope successfully when they get out will be less successful. So in fact, the belief that if you tre didn't treat them so well, they wouldn't come back is actually the opposite of the truth. But that is the environment, and, and certainly in a large extent political environment, in which we operate and operate this huge system and deal with a legislator and a public and uh, sometimes the media who, who base a lot of information on emotion and um, not that it's not factual, but perhaps not in the context. I saw that I was quoted recently as saying that the entire Department of Corrections should not be judged on one case that's gone bad. And every person in our department, whether it's every incarcerated person or every parolee, probation, or employee, should not be judged on the basis of one case that didn't have a good outcome. But, but the fact is that frequently we are. Laws have been changed in our state because of one bad case. Bob mentioned an example. Um, 1992, the parole board was changed as a result of a bad case, and we've continued to see that happen. And so those, those facts drive the situation. When I became the director, as we said, we were we had continued to go up. We surpassed 50,000 prisoners, uh, as we predicted we would. One of the um, changes that had been implemented that was a, a piece of that, certainly not the only thing, there were a lot of factors that drove that, but one piece of it was the implementation of truth and sentence. Michigan is one of two 100% truth in sentencing states in the United States. In Michigan, that means that a prisoner must serve 100% of the minimum sentence the judge gives them. The judge sentences you to 5 to 20. 20 is set by law based on the crime. 5, the judge gives you. In Michigan, today still, you must serve 100% of five years. Mr. Brown talked about a period of time under the Emergency Powers Act when time was taken off. In addition to that, prisoners earned good time. That does not happen in Michigan today with the exception of those prisoners who were sentenced from um, years ago before those laws went into effect. One of the discussions I will never forget is I had been the director about a month and I was speaking to the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan. There were at least, um, I would say 50, of 83 prosecutors there, maybe more, but at least 50 of the prosecutors were there. And they said to me, the single most important accomplishment of the Prosecuting Attorneys Association throughout our very long history, the single most important accomplishment was the enactment of truth and sentencing. And in fact, they, I mean, that, that clearly is a focal point when we deal with the prosecutors. I, I spoke with them last week, and that remains a focal point. Michigan is a 100% truth in sentencing state and uh, is probably going to stay that way for the foreseeable future because there is just not support for that to change. So from a political standpoint, we've actually approached this issue from a number of other directions because sometimes it doesn't matter what's right or wrong. It does matter what you can get support for, which is something I'm going to talk about as, as I work this along because that's the reality of it. If you can't get support, it doesn't matter. Because you're not going to get it, you're not going to accomplish it. Dennis mentioned a, um, a, a tragic incident that occurred right when I became director. Uh, another uh, incident that occurred during my tenure um, occurred in February 2006, the, the third week of February, three years ago. And when you look at the population, over time, and you see when we started to stabilize, and then you see the bump up. The bump up was a, we went up 500 beds in one month after the cell pack murders in February of 2006, and we went up by 1,500 beds before that year was over, attributable to a very high profile and highly publicized crime. And that is the environment that we work in and live in. And whether you're a judge who's facing someone and has to sentence them, or you're a member of the parole board, or you're a parole agent determining whether a violation should be addressed by a return to prison or some other sanction, 
Uh, every, the common denominator in all of that are human beings. And human beings respond to those things. And, and that is a natural thing that happens when you see a horrible tragedy like that, is that that's one of the things that happens. And, and part of what we do and the, and the environment we operate in is to talk about that. I tell people all the time that I know we're doing the right thing in taking our population down. And, and I absolutely know that it's the right thing to do from every possible level. And it's not an economic issue. It's also about investment in human beings. And it's about investment in our state and money being used better. But it's also about the cost of incarcerating so many people and their families who come along with them and everything that goes with that. But the reality is that when something like that happens, sometimes people forget the overall balance of that. It's almost impossible to. I have a, um, a bag of newspapers that I carry with me, and I'm, I'm surprised they didn't bring them today. I almost always do. And what they are is a series of headlines that kind of mark all of these different things that we've dealt with. And uh, one of the, the headlines says, Dead Man's Father Demands Apology. And I will tell you that nobody, no matter how much you believe the direction you're going is right, nobody can ignore the human factor of the business we work in. It is, what, it is the business we're in. And, and there are no guarantees. And so we know as we proceed with what we're doing and as we have implemented policies that are intended to have our population be smaller, that we know that uh, I have people say to me very frequently when I speak in forums like this, can you guarantee me that none of these people who will get out of prison will hurt someone or do something bad? And uh, very honestly, I, I certainly I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that none of us in this room won't commit a felony in the next 24 hours or in the next year or 10 years. I can't make that guarantee. I can't make it about anybody. I can't make it about the, the convicted felons who are under our supervision. I can't make it for anyone. But, but those factors very much drive policy. And if someone doesn't think they do, um, walk through our halls once in a while because it does. It is a very big part of it. One of the other political uh, things that happened and, and really flipped from when um, Bob was the director to when I was the director was the local political environment. Because I remember being in county government before I worked for the Department of Corrections and during the period of time when Bob was the director and the system was expanding and I remember, I, I come from a community where there are prisons and I remember Bob sending the folks up there to convince the community about building another prison. And, and we were, everyone was pretty heavy into not in my backyard in those days. Nobody wanted prisons. And we expanded this huge prison system across the state. And many of those prisons were put in the Upper Peninsula where I live. And the reason is because we, we ended up going into communities who either uh, didn't have the political ability to say no to us or needed the economic development activity of the prison so badly they said yes. Well, what's flipped from that is I am now regularly visited by the people from those communities. When I was first director, they used to come down and ask what they could do to convince me to build another prison in their community. They've gotten the message. Now they come down to beg me what, I, what they can do to ensure I don't close their prison or any of their prisons. And that is a huge cultural change that's occurred. I have a book in front of me here. It's a book I reference a lot. Um, it's called Going Up the River, Travels in a Prison Nation. And one of the main themes of this book is that over a period of decades, our country converted from a military industrial-based economy to a prison industrial-based economy. When I first read this book in 2001, I was really offended by that theme. I have come to not just be offended, but strongly agree with that, because I see the results of this. And I, and I talk to communities, I talk to our staff, and I say that we do not incarcerate people to provide jobs. It would be immoral to incarcerate people to provide jobs. Most of us understand that. 
But if you have to do something I've had to do many times, which is go to a community and sit in a public forum and explain to them why it's their prison that's closing, you will walk away not feeling so good about whether or not we incarcerate people who do our job. It, it is a difficult, it is a very, very difficult um, theory, and you have to face that. So what happened that caused this change? And what were the operational issues? Well, there were a number of them. When I uh, became the director, we had about 50,000 prisoners. We went up as high as 51,300 after the Celotech murders. We had more than 18,000 employees. One in three state employees worked for the Department of Correction. Our budget was looming on that big 2.0 with a B after it something we have surpassed. Um, 75,000 people on probation and parole. And I was thinking about this yesterday. I was in, in church, and our priest was talking in homily about how painful and difficult change is. And he said change occurs when the pain of change becomes less than the pain of continuing to do the same thing. And I thought of coming here today when Father Paul said that. I, I won't tell him I stopped thinking about what he was saying and started thinking about that and this, but I did. And, and because in a large part that is what happened because we did reach that tipping point and, and part of it was the money and part of it was the political environment and, and it was just all of those things together and, and what we weren't getting from that was no crime. What we weren't getting is nobody was coming back. So we were sending all these people to prison and we were keeping them there so long and so far past, even though we can blame truth and sentencing all we want, when I became the director we had 17,600 people who had served past that minimum sentence of 50,000. So, so that's not truth and sentencing, that's us. And, and so all of that combined to a point where we said, this has to stop. And it did become an opportunity that grew from crisis. I mean, certainly a large part of it was the economic crisis. And at that time, we were having discussions about, you know, what do we do? Do we reopen places that have been mothballed because we didn't feel we could use them? Do we put beds on the floor? I, uh, and Dennis will, will uh, agree with this, I have adamantly refused to do that no matter what it takes because I was a warden during the period of time when I had mattresses on the floor of a day room that prisoners were on, and you cannot run a prison like that, and I'm not going to have it run under my leadership like that. So we're not going back to that. And like I said, we're, we're not going to do that. Here's some things we're not going to do. Here's one of them. And, and so, so we had to do some other things. And, and at that point in time, clearly we were blessed. We were part of the new administration looking for some, some, some new focus and to start looking on... Uh, re-entry and what I like to refer to as getting people out and keeping them out. Getting out is not nearly as hard as staying out successfully. And not to imply that getting out is easy, but, but staying out is what's tough. And one of the things that we realized was that we had done such a good job responding to the buildup and to running a department that was designed to do that. We ran a very good, safe, and secure prison system. If you look at our prison statistics, um, Bob audits prison systems all over the country, and, and it's something he's commented to me on, and, and, and others do too. I mean, we're, we're known for having a well-run prison system. What we needed to be known for was not just running a safe and secure prison system, but for our prison system to be active partners in getting people out and keeping them out. And we had never previously thought of that. I, I tell truthfully stories of when I was a warden, I really worried about everyone goes home safely every day, keep the lid on the joint, all of that. That's important. We need our wardens to worry about that. I never thought about when the prisoners left. I never thought about a connection between the time they did and whether they'd be successful when they went home. No one expected me to think about that. I didn't think about it. I knew the parole agent in my community only because his mom lived down the street from me and they went to my church. Otherwise, I would never have known the agent. 
That's not acceptable in a system who has to be integrated to get people out. And so one of the things we said about early on was changing the culture so that the people in our prison, so our wardens thought, they knew part of their job was to be an active, proactive part of getting people out and keeping them out. It was a very different change for people. It's hard. It's a lot harder to be a warden thinking about that than just running the prison, which is hard enough on its own, trust me. But when now you got to worry about what happens when people leave and whether what you're doing in prison is contributing to what happens on the outside. We say all the time that our mission is to protect the public. We do that by running safe and secure prison system and supervising offenders in our community. Now we say that if we aren't part of keeping people from committing more crimes and creating more victims, we're not doing our job to protect the public. And so that is what our focus is now. We have a ways to go in doing, as in any huge change, if, uh, if you were to ask me where we are in that, are we there 100%? No, but we're moving there 100%. I am every day encouraged by a staff person who tells me that I stay with our department when I could retire because this is the right thing to do. I feel like I'm part of something important. When they see an offender fail and they feel they have failed, that is a very different message. I was a warden during the period of time when we had zero tolerance for parole violation. It made sense. It's intuitive. If you can't follow the rules, then you go back to prison. And, and I remember the very first time it struck me was I was talking to a prisoner in my facility, and he, he was telling me he had come back in a parole violation. And I asked him what had happened. And he said, well, I had a job, and I was on a curfew, so I was only allowed to go to work. And I had to be home by a certain time. And I stopped at the store to buy pork chops. And I remember what he told me he bought, buy pork chops. I got home five minutes late. I was violated on that. And I remember thinking to myself, that cannot be true. And, and I followed up on it because it bothered me, and it was true. He was back in prison. He had a job. He was five minutes late getting home. He came back. The people who put those rules in place didn't do that to be mean and malicious. They did that because they believed that that was the way to send that message. Now we know that's not true. Now we base what we're doing on what research and evidence tells us works. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. When I first met Dennis, one of the things he said to me, that I did not believe. He said that there is no correlation between misconduct in prison, and I'm not talking about like serious assault on staff. I'm talking about normal misconduct prisoners get like they're out of place and disobey direct orders. We write thousands of them. He said there's no correlation between institutional misconduct and success on parole, with the exception of women, where there's an inverse correlation. The more they get, the more successful they'll be. I remember telling him, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I do remember this discussion, Dennis? Yes, indeed. If you don't know what you're talking about. Seared in I've my memory. I've been there. Well, I started paying attention to what the research said, and I started reading that over and over and over. And you know what? Now I believe it. And when it comes to the women, when I think about it, and I think about the path that women take to prison, it makes sense to me. The women who learn to stand up for themselves and say no, and not be influenced are probably more likely to be successful when they get out. But the average person that does not make sense. For many of my staff today, it does not make sense when you say that there's not a correlation between misconduct and prison. I tell our staff, I'm pretty sure just knowing myself, if I was in prison, I'd get a lot of misconduct. Most of them would be insolence and disobeying a direct order. If we wrote those in state government, I'd get a few of them in my job. You know what? I get it now. We have to think differently. All of those things, those operating changes, 
are part of what we are working at incorporating. We are seeing the results. Our population is dropping now pretty dramatically for several months now, starting before Thanksgiving. Every Friday, I get the count, and it's broken down. I've been the director for six years, and I, I've always said we have about 50,000 people in prison. We don't have about 50,000 people anymore. And we're about to drop to 47 something. We're at 48, I think 112 on Friday. We're gonna make the drop to the 47s. The last time we're in the 47s, we went through them so fast, we didn't even know we were there, we're on our way up. It's a combination of things that are happening. We wanna take a lot of credit for that. A big part of it is what's happening with reentry and getting people to think differently. How we supervise in the community, how we approach things. Court commitments are also down in Michigan. Um, here's a counterintuitive piece of information for you. One of the most common questions I get is, how in this difficult economy could you ever think about doing this? Everyone knows crime goes up. When, as my time is up, <laughs> crime goes up when the economy is bad. There actually is not a correlation. There is not the direct correlation there out there. And I understand that employment is bad. It's hard to find jobs. We also don't keep people in prison because they're unemployed. It's not the core form. So, um, I will stop my time so we can start, stop my talking so we can use the time we have left to respond to what's on your mind. Uh, I hope I've given you a flavor of the environment. Which okay. Thank you, Greg. One, um, one of the visions that the department has is that every prisoner who is released to the community will have the tools necessary to succeed. That is the vision of the reentry initiative. I do want to introduce to you Mary King, who is the community coordinator for Washtenaw County, and uh, who is a uh, leader who shares this vision. So we are collecting these cards, and um, this is a penmanship test as much as anything, um, and a uh, eyesight test for me, I'm sure. Let me see about these questions here. This is a question for Director Caruso. Are all parolees eligible for the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative? If not, what other programs are available for those who are not eligible for MPRI? Well, I guess the, the, probably the short answer is everyone is eligible. El the, the, who goes through that is determined by the parole board. And one of the decisions we made early on is that we were not going to go after just the easy uh, candidates, the people who would give us big numbers and good success so we could say we've done this. Because there's a, there's a group of people, there's a percentage of people who are going to be successful really no matter what we do and maybe in spite of what we do. There, there are people for whom just having committed whatever the offense was and having come to prison, they're going to be successful when they get out and you don't have to do anything with them. And so while yes, if the parole board says those people need to go to MPRI, they're eligible, we, don't, we have not populated it with people who we didn't think needed that. We have tried to populate it with people who are in the moderate to high risk for reoffending categories because that's where our resources are best done. I hope that answers that. Yes, thank you very much. We have uh, just a stack of cards here. So um, one for uh, Director Brown. Um, what, in your view, can civilians do to help their loved ones prepare for release? Well, I think the support of family, the support of friends is probably one of the most important things that those folks can look for. Uh, yeah, you can help find a job and you can help, you know, be supportive in, in, in other ways, but they, they, you've, you've got to let them know that you care. You've got to let them know that whatever they've done in the past is in the past, including behavior. And I think with that kind of support, uh, they're not asking for much more. They're not asking for a handout. Uh, they, they just want that support. All right, thank you. For Director Caruso, 
Is it true that the governor has just abolished, abolished the parole board? What does this mean? The, the governor by executive order abolished the parole board and established the new parole and commutation board. And in, in doing that, expands the board from the current 10 to 15 members. So technically, the old parole board, which was established by Governor Engler in 1992, is abolished, but is becoming a, an expanded board and under their jurisdiction now officially the commutation. Let me see. I can remember when the parole board was five members. Five members. Uh, let's see. Wow. There are some real tough questions here. Um, let me skip over them. <laughs> not really. I'm not going to do that. Um, this one's not easy. Uh, let's give it to my boss. Uh, in your opinion, how can we get across the counterintuitive but evidence-heavy messages that could get the public behind better policy and laws? We try and do that by talking about it. Doing things like this, where people who care about what's going on come forward. Some of you may be here because your students and your professors told you to come, but I'm guessing that, that even the students are here for other reasons. But there are also members of the public who have chosen to come and help spread the word. We also do it by speaking to the media. This week, I'm going to be meeting with the editorial board of the Detroit Free Press, something I have done on a number of occasions, and this is what we'll be talking about. And uh, we talk to legislators. You can do the same thing. You need to, to be ed help us by, by being educated and communicating that. And one of the things, if we go back to what I talked about, there, the only guarantee there really is that something bad probably will happen. I mean, I can promise you, if we cut our parole rate in half and I build a few more prisons, something bad will still happen by someone who got out of prison. It's going to happen. And so, so we need to not jump on the emotional uh, roller coaster that's so easy to do. Good policy is not made based on emotion. Thank you. For Mr. Brown, what sort of impact do you believe prison overcrowding has on inmates? What are the consequences of prisoner crowding on rehabilitation? Well, you reinforce the notion that prisoners have that you don't give a damn about them. When you have to start putting, having people sleep on floors, when you can't adequately, adequately manage and people get assaulted because you, you, you've got so many of them, uh, I can remember a deputy warden saying one time and saying it to a reporter and it looked bad in the press, uh, you know, this yard is so crowded, they, the recreation yard is so crowded that if a prisoner gets stabbed, he doesn't have any place to fall. Well, part of that control and management that I spoke of earlier is trying to control the aggressiveness and keep people safe. You know, people are sent to do time, but they, they, they should be able to expect to do it safely. Thank you. There's a lot of these questions I'd like to try to answer, but I, I don't get to do that. Let me uh, put another tough one to the director. That's why you get the big bucks. Uh, number one, why is truth in sentencing wrong from a policy perspective, and why is it right to downsize? Do you have evidence for these views? I'm not sure that, that I would say that truth in sentencing is wrong. Um, and I don't mean to imply that. I mean, it is what the law is in Michigan. And, and I understand how we got there, because under our old system, the old good time system, uh, was very complicated. And the more time you did, the more time you earned off. So if your sentence was 20 or more years, you were earning 15 days for every 30. And what happened was, from a, a victim standpoint, they would see someone sentenced to, you know, 25 to 50 years, and you know, 10 or 15 years later, the person was out, and it was very difficult to understand. And so, I think there's a way to address all ends of that. So, I'm not implying that it's bad. 
Um, it, it is what we, what we have. And, and the other side of that, what we have attacked in Michigan is length of stay. Because what is driving our population is how long people stay. And much of that is how long they stay past the sentence the judge gives them, which in Michigan we're almost twice the national average length of stay. Um, nationally, the average prisoner served is uh, about 30 months, and in Michigan it's 51. So that's pretty significant. Other side of that, why is um, right-sizing um, the right thing to do? Um, one of the things Mr. Brown talked about was, you know, every dollar we spend incarcerating someone is the dollar we're not spending on something else. And we certainly, I would say, have reached the, uh, the point of diminishing returns. If having a prison population the size we have is not providing a, a reduction in crime, and it's not having those types of coming to prison isn't resulting in people um, not coming back. I mean, all of the things that are happening if they're not that we're hoping to happen aren't happening, and yet we're still spending two point one billion dollars on the Department of Corrections. Then, then there's a better way to spend our money. And if, as we know, what the evidence now shows us, the lo staying longer doesn't make it less likely that you're going to offend, we're really not getting our money's worth. At an average of $32,000 a year per prisoner in, in Michigan in prison, if you're on probation and parole, it's less than $3,000 average. The difference between those two every year for thousands and thousands of people is going to make a difference. I think that is the right thing. Mr. Brown, you want to add to that? Well, let me, let me say that you can't afford not to. You, the taxpayer, cannot afford not to have our system downsized. You know, I coined several years ago, I coined the phrase that, uh, that we're a society addicted to locking folks up. And when you're addicted to something, you have some money to do that, to, 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 to feed that addiction. But when you run out of that money, you start taking money that's meant for other things. And that's what we've done for the last 10 to 15 years. We've taken money. The, the educators used to love me because I would say in speech, speeches that we're spending money for prisons that we ought to be spending to educate our children. Now they twisted around and said, yeah, the director of the corrections said that we should take money from corrections and put it, give it to the schools. <laughs> no, that's not right now, but that's, you get the drift. Thank you. For Director Caruso. What are the main disagreements in the state legislature regarding prison reform? What reforms require legislative action? And what reforms can be implemented independently by the governor or the DOC? The, the most significant reforms that are in play right now, and though we do have a package of bills uh, in, that the legislature will be hopefully acting on this year, uh, actually, for the large part, do not require legislative action. Um, there, there's the reason our population is dropping now and things that we've already put into place. Um, the reason I mentioned to you when I became director were at 17,600 past the earliest release date and had served that minimum sentence and for whatever reason we're still in prison. We now are at 11,000 something. And that is very significant because for each of those six years, each day of those six years, someone else joined that club. So it's not like we just took 6,000 out of the group, or whatever that is, whatever, 6,000, yeah, 6,000 out. We took out 6,000 plus however many joined it over that period of time. So that, that's a, that, we don't need legislative action to do that. We just need to do that. Um, right now, we, we are looking at um, limiting the discretion of the parole board through legislative action, which limits it to, um, with some exceptions, 120% of the minimum sentence. And uh, that's something we can implement without legislative action. But putting it in statute will keep it going long after those of us are gone. We are uh, looking at putting uh, one of the bills in front of the legislature is that people do not, in our vernacular, max out. If you have a 5 to 20 and you serve every day of 20 years, that means you maxed out in our language. And uh, we have taken the position that the public is not well served when people leave prison with absolutely no supervision. 
And so what we are putting in place is that everyone has at least nine months of supervision in the community. And, and you know, we'll work with the local law enforcement. We know where someone is. There are services that go into that. Um, none of those things, those are operational issues, not legislative issues, even though we're asking for them to be put into law so that they, they go forward. Um, things that would require legislative action would be if we want to get into the sentencing structure in Michigan. If we want to look at, which has happened in the past, the, the, the statutory sentences for various offenses. And there are some in Michigan that even though they have changed, they still remain very long. There are pieces that come with that where we tie um, consecutive sentencing with certain, certain types of drug offenses. People, I, we had a case recently, the governor commuted, where a, a woman who had, I think, five separate drug felonies, no one of them had a max more than five years. They were fairly small sentences, but they had to be served consecutively. I mean, finish one and go to the next, the next. She was going to do 25 years flat before she was eligible for the parole board. And any one of the sentences were less than five years. So those are the types of things legislatively, the structure of how our, that sentences are put together that we do need to tackle. Thank you. For Director Brown, have you ever known someone close to you go to prison? And do you think that this has affected your decision making? I've known folks that I grew up with in school, prison. Uh, does it affect my decision making? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. I uh, come from a family of eight. Six of us were boys. We fought all the time. And uh, I tell them and their children that if you get in trouble, don't call Uncle Bob. <laughs> 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 so, and, and that's just, just the way I feel. I think you've got to be responsible for your actions. And over the years, I think part of the problem has been that we haven't held offenders responsible for their actions, as responsible as we should be. Oh. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions, and I have about 15, 18 cards left up here. Um, I'm, I have, there, the toughest question is here, um, and I'm going to ask it to, to Director Caruso. Who is responsible for the death of Timothy Souders? Well, yeah. Um, you probably know that um, this is a case that uh, where a young 21-year-old man died in one of our prisons a few years ago. Uh, he was mentally ill. And it is, uh, I guess I'm going to talk about it a little bit before sure. I can answer, and I'll see where I work with that. Um, it, it probably, it, it is an excellent example of what's wrong systemically with our system, and particularly dealing with people who are mentally ill, and is one of the reasons that there's a very significant change ongoing, at least in the Department of Corrections, but it's a change that needs to be taking place beyond that. Um, I often have people say to me that, um, you know, Governor Angler closed all the mental hospitals and that's created all this increase in the prison population. And I, I don't know that, that necessarily true, there are pieces of that that are true. But, but what happened across the country when, when the mental hospitals closed, and certainly in Michigan was the intention was the money would flow into our communities because the thought was it would be better just much as what, what we're doing to provide services in communities as compared to in hospitals. But that didn't happen. And so in order to access mental health services locally, people have to be diagnosed as being seriously and persistently mentally ill. Well, most people don't reach, reach that threshold. And so there are many people in our communities who, who, can, who do really well with mental illness if, if they have the right resources available to them, but maybe they don't. And what happens is they wear out all of the systems that are there and the local law enforcement and the courts and the judges, and oftentimes then people end up in prison. About 25% of our prison population 
has some history of mental illness. They are not people who would be currently diagnosed as actively mentally ill, but some history of that. And those people, the majority of them, look like and come to us for the kind of reasons I'm explaining. And 10% of our population are on psychotropic medications. So those are people who are seriously mentally ill and are getting assistance in prison. So the problem in prison is it's a, not a good place for people who are mentally ill. Because so often the types of behaviors that people who are mentally ill exhibit look exactly like the types of behaviors that people who are unmanageable and disruptive exhibit. In prison, what saves people's lives is knowing that if this, hap if this happens, we do this. If that happens, we do that. Consistent consistency and, and a way of dealing with if this, and for correction officers to know, if you do this, I have to do that. And, and, and you know, if you look at 50,000 people and, and all of the things that we deal with and, you know, all the staff and the hundreds of thousands of decisions that are made every day in all of those interactions, most of those decisions work out obviously well because we don't deal with those tragic cases. This is a tragic case that didn't end up that way, where a 21-year-old man died in prison. Uh, their staff thought they were doing the right thing in responding to what they thought was to be real. Um, we have accepted responsibility, we and other agencies, for that death because it shouldn't have happened. Um, and if any good news comes from something, I hate to say good news in the same sentence as a young person dying, but um, there, are, there are very significant changes happening in our department in terms of mentally ill, and, and a goal that I have stated publicly, that with few exceptions, it is my goal that mentally ill people will not be in segregation. Um, but, but it's a difficult place to get. And we are responsible to protect the prisoners and the staff in our facilities, all of those lives. And sometimes some of the methods used in dealing with the disruptive behavior exhibited by Mr. Souders in, in many cases, many cases, have saved people's lives and saved them from themselves. And so it is a very difficult case. That was a tough question. Thank you, Director, very much. I have a question for you. Now the audience, will everyone who's eligible to vote please raise your hands? You are responsible for the state prison system. Thank you very much. Okay. 